Here are some measured hall veins. Okay? So for those guppies in Trinidad that were revolving pretty fast, the number of spots in the area of orange spots, when you took away the predator and suddenly being brightly colored wasn't risky anymore and females liked it so it was good to be brightly colored, those spot numbers increased quickly. They were increasing at about 0.7 hull day. In the Galapagos finches that Peter and Rosemary Grant studied, they go through El Nino, and during El Nino, it's a strong selective event. So about every 10 years, there's a strong selective event on the Galapagos finches. And during El Nino, they were evolving at about 0.7 haldane in body size. They're getting bigger. And then in the other years, they were getting smaller. So they fluctuate, okay? They go up and down depending upon the El Nino conditions in the Galapagos. There have also been lots of measurements of uh, slower rates, for example, since the extinction of their competitors in the late 19th century, the surviving Hawaiian honeycreeper, the Eevee, has been evolving a, a shorter bill. And uh, that's been a very slow rate of evolution. The migratory timing of Columbia River salmon has been changing as a result of the human fishery on them. All of the fished populations of the world are evolving under the pressure of human fishing. Most of the fish in the world are getting smaller. Many of the stocks are collapsing. It's producing a change in the time of year that the Columbia River salmon run up the Columbia. Uh, this is also due to the building of dams on the Columbia. So these, this is a human-induced selection pressure. These are fairly slow rates. So what does this mean if we just try to think about these rates and evolutionary time? Uh, a Galapagos finch is about 25 grams, They're about the size of a house sparrow. They evolved during El Nino at about half a gram a year. What if the El Nino conditions persisted forever? What if it wasn't the southern oscillation that was driving the rainfall pattern in the Galapagos? What if it just stayed warm and wet for a long time in the Galapagos? Well, that would produce directional selection, and if you did it for 100 years, it would turn a 25-gram finch into a 75-gram finch. Basically, it would take a finch and turn it into a small robin. Okay? If you did it for 10,000 years, it would turn it into a turkey. Now, finches as big as turkeys don't do very well in a finch habitat. They are living in a place where they hop around in bushes. They are living in an environment in which food is sometimes very hard to come by. I've been observing the turkeys that live near my garden in Hamden trying to get up into the trees next to Lake Whitney to pick the berries off as winter has come on and it's gotten very cold. They're pretty clumsy. So what will happen if you keep a strong directional selection going on finches. What would happen to humans if there were strong directional selection on humans to increase in body size? What would happen if we got turned from, say, 50 to 80 kilo primates into three ton primates? How long could that go on? One of the fastest rates of evolution ever measured in the fossil record was when elephants went onto islands in the Mediterranean and turned from 12-ton elephants down into things about the size of a St. Bernard. Okay, they did it in less than 100,000 years. They did it because they were food limited and they'd been released from predation pressure. Okay? So how far can that process go? These are quick changes that we're describing. The finches are moving pretty fast. The guppies are moving pretty fast. The elephants change pretty quickly. But if you look over the whole spread of evolutionary time, over hundreds of millions of years, things stay within a fairly narrow envelope of body sizes. Why does that happen? So if we look at microevolutionary rates, and uh, by the way, there are good papers on this. If you're interested in rates, this is a good paper topic. Um, Lots of measurements, lots of argument about why. They vary from very fast to very slow. The fastest are in the finches and in the Trinidad guppies. 
There have been lots of rates measured in Hawaiian mosquito fish and Hawaiian honey creepers, so there are lots of estimates available. And interestingly, the shorter the period over which the rate is measured, the greater the maximum rate. So if you measure a rate by making comparisons between two populations that have been separated for hundreds of years or hundreds of generations, it's usually fairly slow. And if you focus in and you just look at a brief period, it can be very fast. Why do you think that might be? Why might we measure a faster rate when we do so over a shorter period of time? If we measure it over a short period of time, sometimes it's faster. If we measure it over a long period of time, it's slower. Does that suggest anything about what the pattern might look like that I'm about to draw on the board? Yeah. Um, you got it. That's all it takes. It just has to go up and down. If I measure it over this period, it looks pretty fast. If I measure it over this period, it looks pretty slow. That's all it is. OK. The take home message from many studies done in the 70s, 80s, and 90s is that evolution can be very fast when populations are large and selection is strong. And the reason for that is that big populations have lots of genetic variation. So there's a potential for a big response to selection. Small populations don't have so much genetic variation. So even though selection might be strong, they can't respond so well. This point, the shorter the time interval over which you measure the rate, the higher the maximum rate. And here's one reason why you can't take Galapagos finches and turn them into turkeys and then turn the turkeys into ostriches and then turn the ostriches into moas and then have the moas turn into Tyrannosaurus rex. Okay? As you push things very far in any direction, there's an internal process that converts the directional selection into stabilizing selection. And those are the trade-offs, the linkages among traits. If you try to make a finch very large, then although it may be gaining something in terms of, say, food capturing ability, it is giving up maneuverability. If you try to take uh, elephants and make them very small, then at some point they are not going to be able to compete with other elephants for food supply, even though there may not be any predators there. Um, there are all kinds of biomechanical linkages within bodies where trade-offs are involved. So if you look within the organism, you see that it's a bundle of linkages and compromises. And every time you try to change one trait, you have a byproduct, you have an implicit selection going on on other traits. So although you may be realizing a benefit in one, you are, place, you are paying a cost in the others. The most striking example we've seen of it in the lecture so far is the guppy, the male guppy. If he evolves to be bright and a wonderful dancer so that females just love to mate with him, he will get killed by a predator. That is about as straightforward and brutal a trade-off as you can imagine. Okay? But these go on all over the place, and some of them are very subtle. <laughs> 